lot of people say, oh, Bitcoin can't go to a million. Are you kidding me? During COVID, Bitcoin went from 3,000 to 60,000. That's 20X based off of lowering interest rates and quantitative easing. We're about to go into that right now. What would Bitcoin bonds do for, for the Bitcoin price action? We're talking to a few different sovereigns. One of the sovereigns has about 30 billion barrels of oil off of their shore. When they issued a Bitcoin bond, they would be issuing it from their nationalized oil company. Bitcoin is the best money by far. It's an engineered money. It's the most pristine form of collateral in the world. Nothing can compete with it, not gold or silver or anything, because it's trustless. We need to get Bitcoin on our balance sheet. And then as we print money, nothing is going to grow faster than Bitcoin. The difference between inflation and hyperinflation is trust. Bitcoin is entering the political realm. We, the people, are fighting against the money changers, and they're going to do everything they can in order to maintain control. It's not going to be nation states who are the risk-free borrowers in the future. In the very near future, it's going to be Bitcoiners who are the risk-free borrowers. That is how you save social security. That is how you recapitalize the republic and make social security great again. That is how you take any government program in any country that is failing and you recapitalize it with Bitcoin bonds. Do you have any personal highlights for Bitcoin uh, in the last five months? Yeah. So, I mean, the biggest news since we last spoke was Bitcoin kind of entering the political space, especially here in the United States. Uh, RFK coming out and demonstrating his orange pilling. Um, Donald Trump coming out and announcing that if he became president, that the United States would become one of the lowest cost energy producers in the world and become a Bitcoin mining powerhouse. And of course, the headlines were the, the strategic uh, reserve or stockpile of Bitcoin, which amazingly call it Trump derangement syndrome. Uh, I don't know what you call it, but the United States now moving its Bitcoin ever since that announcement. Uh, we had 200,000. I think we're just below 200,000 now. So it's just so wild to see that Bitcoin is entering the political realm so quickly. You know, we're like in year 15 and a decade ago when I started, this was like, ah, oh, this is not going to happen for a long time. You'd be laughed out of the room if you told them that presidential candidates would make it part of their platform. Uh, but here we are. Uh, and and what's amazing about it is that um, the conservatives have kind of forced the liberals to to say something, right? You see uh, Kamala coming out trying to do her crypto reset with uh, what's his what's his name, Mark Cuban, and a whole bunch of those other people getting behind that crypto. Notice it's crypto for Harris, not Bitcoin for Harris. Crypto for Harris, uh, and thankfully that's not gaining a lot of traction, especially after she came out with price controls and everything. But yeah, I mean, that's the biggest thing for me, I think, post post having post what we've since we've talked is just Bitcoin becoming like a number one talking point of the political campaign. Candidates going out of their way to reach out to this constituency, which is, is to me is a sign of accelerated adoption. So it's very exciting to see. Uh, it's, it's also really exciting. I, I was a little bit surprised how badly the bitcoin community took trump's speech for me it was really a positive speech but i think like people like had so high expectation that he's like oh let's buy a million bitcoin or something <laughs> like that but for a future president like i think he's still the leading candidate for the presidential election um him going out and saying all the things he said he literally said bitcoin do the moon and, and and like the memes and all the other things that he said like there are a lot of nice things that he said along the way in the speech that has been like that's a really positive sign like a really really bullish sign um are you <laughs> are you unsatisfied with the reaction with with price and with the community and everything or or did you expect that yeah you know that's a great question because in 2019, Trump was president and came out and said that Bitcoin's backed by nothing. It's just thin air and that the dollar is the best currency in the world. And he's the president of the United States. So he, he you know, he's obligated to say that and defend our currency. Uh, and at that time, that was disappointing. But from where we were then to the statements that he made at the Bitcoin conference, uh, they show a tremendous advancement in his understanding and I think the biggest mistake, actually, of the Bitcoin conference itself was to let RFK speak before Trump because he came in and just look, I mean, no offense to him. He sh it should be RFK versus Trump, but we don't have democracy here in the United States. Kamala just got shooed in with no voting. The DNC convention is going on right now. She's going to end up being the nominee with no uh, democratic process. So in my opinion, you know, RFK got screwed over and it really should be him 
versus Trump, but because it's not him versus Trump, he could say very like extreme things. He doesn't have to reach out. He doesn't have to be so centric and reach out to both sides of the aisle. So he was able to say some things that we all wished and hoped that Trump was going to say. But in reality, Trump has to still win. He still has to get the votes. So he has to be less, what's the word I'm looking for? Less uh, radical, right? Because that's what the normies will call it. They'll call it, rat. you know, Trump's radical. He wants to buy a million Bitcoin. He wants to do that. You know, if you said some of the things that RFK said, then Trump would be be called radical. And he was he's still being called radical for some of the things he said. And you can see it in the current administration's actions. He wants to start a stock a stockpile reserve. They start selling it. So they're doing it's like the opposite game. And he came out. There were a couple of good points, actually, I, I'd like to touch on because um, the first thing was that low cost energy producer, USA Bitcoin mining powerhouse. That understands a, a very deep understanding of, of Bitcoin's second and third order effects for mining. You know, for those who follow me, you know, I say that we don't need green peace. We need orange peace. And, you know, Bitcoin is the only sustainably incentivized uh, network in humanity that's driving energy technology innovation. When you integrate Bitcoin into the power grid, it becomes more secure. And understanding that process, which I've talked to a few people in the industry, and uh, I think if you go look at Matt Schultz timeline, the uh, co-founder and chair of uh, CleanSpark, he had a great uh, experience and interaction with Trump. And he felt confident that Trump understands the benefits of Bitcoin uh, and what Bitcoin mining can do for the country and for the security of the grid and for the efficiency of the grid. So that's a really big understanding, like to go from 2019, hey, it's thin air to 2024. Hey, uh, you know, we want to tap into our oil. We want to become a low cost energy producer and we want to become a Bitcoin mining powerhouse. Why? Because he understands the benefit of integrating Bitcoin mining into the grid and into the into our, our nation's uh, system, energy system. So that's a that's a really jump, big jump forward for him, I thought. The second thing he said was that he would take advantage of stable coins to uh, extend the dominance of the dollar. And that was a really big statement and understanding to me that it was kind of like a soft acknowledgement that the dollar has a little bit of an issue. Right. And uh, not a couple months ago, I spoke at the uh, Bitcoin Energy Summit in Miami. I had the honor to share the panel with uh, Congressman Byron Donalds, who happens to just be my local representative in southwest Florida. But he sits on the United States Financial Services Committee, and he told us in the group that on the Financial Services Committee, one of the things that they're talking about is the concern over the lack of demand on U.S. Treasuries. Now, this is the Financial Services Committee. This is no joke. This is like where they talk about the most important things. And one of the topics is lack of demand on U.S. Treasuries. Meanwhile, the uh, Yellen, the Secretary uh, Treasury of the Treasury, is saying that, uh, you know, Treasury market is perfectly liquid. So you have two like contracting points there. One is, well, wait, there's a, we're concerned about the, the lack of demand on treasuries. And the other one says, oh, everything is fine. So for Trump to say that, there has to be some whisper in the, bra in the background to understand that if they get this stablecoin bill attached to some bigger bill and push it through, then stablecoins will be required to be backed one-to-one -one by U.S. cash equivalents or cash. So basically U.S. treasury debt. And- that's really important because in their mind, it creates demand on U.S. Treasuries. Now, kind of like going off a little caveat here, and I am apologize, but I have to do this because I find this so interesting and nobody's talking about it. But I wrote a thread on this a year ago, literally last August, about stablecoins. And, and what's going on is responsible legislation is going to reveal irresponsible regulation. Because what we have is a fully backed reserve model with stable coins versus the famous fractional reserve banking system, the central banking system that a lot of Bitcoiners are saying, hey, you know, this creates a lot of the problems. And it does. But now we have uh, the potential in the United States for people to have a decision to make. If they pass the stable coin bill and you have one to one guarantees, uh oh, now we have bank deposits and now we have uh, stable coins. So would you like to keep your dollars in a bank where they're backed by one penny to 10 cents and you can only access them when we say and you can only access them with our permission? And by the way, if you need money on Sunday, you better come to the ATM on Saturday. Uh, and if you need more than $10,000, you better email us and let us know so that we can set up an appointment to get you $10,000 of cash. 
right? So you have all these limitations plus all of the additional risk of it only really being backed by the bank's assets, which range from a penny to 10 cents. And then of course, FDIC. But then if FDIC gets triggered, you talk about inflation, right? Going back to the bank term funding program with the Silicon Valley Bank, how they fix it? Inflation. So it's really not insured. It's really not secured. And then you look at the stablecoin model and you say, hey, you can have 24-7, 365 access to liquidity. You can move it whenever you want without anybody's permission. And most importantly, by law, if the stablecoin bill passes, by law, it will be backed one-to-one. So, you know, it, in my personal opinion, uh, astute money managers left bank deposits and ran for the money market funds to get the interest, right? Because the banks, that was the, the essence of the problem. The banks took the deposits. They bought the U.S. government debt. The interest rates rose. People wanted their money, but the mark-to-market value on the underlying collateral, the asset was less than the liability. They did not have the money to give back to the customer to bring to another bank or to bring to the money market fund. They didn't have the corresponding asset to transfer. So they needed the bank term funding program so they could post the collateral at par value so that they could then make the transfer of the asset with the liability to the money market fund. And that was just to earn interest. But imagine, you know, that was like a bank run. I think if you get stable coins legally here in the United States, which Trump made it seem like he's, you know, that's one of his missions. If he gets in, he's going to expand the dominance of the dollar with stable coins. And if that's the case scenario, we might go from a bank run due to interest rates to a bank sprint due to the the extra security of a one-to-one reserve, plus all the additional freedoms and benefits you get with the stablecoin model versus the fractional reserve model. So that, you know, that was, I was surprised he said that. I was like, whoa, this is, you know, maybe this is Trump taking a shot back at those money changers, at those central bankers who took a shot at him not too long ago. Uh, to come out and and put the the fractional reserve business model at risk. I always thought it was going to be Bitcoin that would end the fractional reserve business model. It very well may be stable coins that ends up being the death blow to fractional reserve banking. It's also interesting when you look at other countries that already have a US dollar standard, and then you also have other countries that doesn't have the US dollars, but for example, would need the US dollar, uh, or they would need Bitcoin, but they would also benefit a lot from the US dollar, uh, medium term, for example, Turkey with the Turkish lira. I mean, the US dollar is extru- way better <laughs> than the Turkish lira in any metrics. Um, could that lead to like a, a a showdown where the US dollar expands their um, reach to the whole world uh, with the US dollar as like all the weaker currencies then will have a major incentive to just get on a new uh, stable coin US dollar? And then maybe thinking that uh, question a little bit further, if everything actually goes to the US dollar and there's just one fiat currency, which would be um, a weird thing to have, but uh, maybe also impossible. But maybe let's let's come on that after that. Um, would that lead then to a showdown between Bitcoin and US dollar in, in the end of the day between what is the major store of value and unit of account uh, and medium of exchange for the world? Yeah. Oh, that's a beautifully framed question because it just it covers so much. I probably have like five points that I want to make. I'm not even sure if I'm going to remember them all. But the first thing is, is that it's interesting because it isn't ca- it is a counterpoint to what BRICS is doing. Right. We know BRICS is like organizing together. They're about to uh, launch their new payment system. From what I've heard, it's going to be a basket of all the BRICS currencies with the reserve being gold. And this is like. This is what's creating a lot of lack of demand on the dollar is that there's now alternative options. So this is an interesting counterpoint to, you know, what can the dollar start to do to get back some of that demand if we're stuck in a situation where we have to continue to run deficit budgets. And unfortunately, there is no way out of running the deficit budget. That I think is one of the biggest misunderstandings I've seen in the US government and especially by US citizens. And and of course people who who aren't paying close enough attention because uh, the first thing you hear them say is, well, the government just needs to stop spending. Yeah, but if you analyze the US government budget, there's what's called discretionary and non-discretionary, or in other words, mandatory spending uh, and non-mandatory spending. And the the Congress gets to vote on the non-mandatory spending. But what's amazing is 
uh, some of the mandatory spending is like social security, uh, Medicare interest. Those are like the top three expenses right now in the United States. You, you can't not pay for those things. You need those things to be paid or else there's going to be social unrest. Number one, if you don't pay social security, we're going to have huge problems here in the United States. It's kind of like a entrenched Ponzi scheme that needs to be addressed. And hopefully we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit later with Bitcoin bonds. Uh, the second thing is the, the net interest cost. You can't pay interest. You'll default on your loans. You can't, you're, you, that would be like the end of it all. So you definitely can't do that. And then uh, finally, uh, Medicare. And that's another big thing where you, you know the quality of life and standard of living would go so low, there would be civil unrest, just like with Social Security. So these the, the three biggest costs in the U.S. government are – and then behind that, it's the military. But then, the, But those biggest costs are mandatory spending. You have to spend that money. So you say, okay, well, what can the government cut? Because that's a lot of a lot of these people come out and say the government can just cut spending. No, they can't. Because even if they got rid of all non-mandatory spending, and I, when I say all of it, I mean all of it: CIA, FBI, Department of Education, Department of Human Safety and Health Services, everything, every single government service being absolutely closed down, one hundred percent. And the U.S. government still does not collect enough taxes to run a budget surplus. So there is no option for the U.S. government to cut spending in order to have a budget surplus. That is the essence of the problem that we are here in the United States. Our mandatory spending is greater than our tax revenue. So we have to run a budget deficit. And since we have to run a budget deficit, that drives away demand because that creates inflation. The, the deficit is financed through debt monetization, which is inflation, and that sucks value from the currency, and that drives away demand. And where are they going? Well, they're going to this, this – apparently, they're going to go to BRICS alternative payment system. Well, it's kind of like a blessing that BRICS decided to back their currency basket with gold because they went to the, to the old natural money because I guess the idea is – well, it's two things. Number one, it could be misdirection. They haven't really officially announced everything yet, and we don't know all the specific details. It's just speculation at this point. So maybe they're talking about gold, but in the background, they are actually doing something with Bitcoin. I don't know. I hope not because I don't want to see um, the fall of America happen so quickly. I love the Constitution. I love the, our freedoms being protected by the law of the land. And even though they're under attack, they are protected here. And they're not protected anywhere else. You see people getting arrested in the UK for doing retweets. I mean, you know, the rest of the world has pretty much capitulated. That's why the under that's why the United States is under attack so much. But now you have BRICS backing with gold and they go to the natural money. And that's that's interesting because Bitcoin is the technological evolution of money. It's the engineered money. Uh, and, and that gives the United States an option to actually adopt Bitcoin. So if BRICS adopted Bitcoin, I feel like we'd be like in a lot of trouble. But because they're going with gold, it actually leaves this thing open. Number one, OK, let's get our stable coins out there. Let's get these people the ability to get access to our dollars. Like you were saying, the Turkish lira, Argentine. Uh, there's, there's plenty of countries all around the world because every single country is abusing the printer. It's not just the United States. Every single country is extracting value from their citizenry via inflation. So it's a it's a global problem, uh, not just local to the dollar. But their problems are a lot worse because they're not the reserve currency. And they're not what the, it, the global debt is basically issued in dollars. It's, it's a dollar denominated debt. And then the currency markets, you can hedge upside and downside with all of the derivative tools that exist. So this this system is so entrenched and the dollar is so powerful. Um, because of all the tools that are built around it. And if we gave that up, then we'd be in a lot of trouble because we're the financial service committee is already talking about a lack of demand on treasuries. Now you now you move away from that, there's going to be even further lack of demand. But if we can go if we can turn to Bitcoin and we can integrate Bitcoin, we can get an advantage on BRICS. And this could be a big this could be a big move for dollar dominance going far into the future. And I'm starting to see Bitcoin be more of a complementary asset. I want to say money, right? Bitcoin is money and the dollar is currency. So we can't confuse the dollar as currency. Like a currency doesn't fight with money. Money is money. 
And, and Bitcoin is the best money by far. It's an engineered money. It's the most pristine form of collateral in the world. Nothing can compete with it, not gold or silver or anything, because it's trustless, right? That's, the, that's one of the big moves. It's not just about finite supply and the difficulty adjustment and the things we talked about previously. It's also about there being no trust, right? Nodes trust nobody so that we can trust anybody. Well, if BRICS has a gold payment system, they still have to trust the, where the gold is. You still, Russia still has to trust China, and China has to trust India, and India has to trust Africa. And there still requires trust. And there also still requires large costs to security and settlement between those nations. Uh, so it's not really a solution. Bitcoin's the solution, and it's the money solution. But I think it really defines the dollar as currency. And we can have a, a, a money with a currency um, living together and working together and the, and the dollar could really become almost a derivative of, of Bitcoin, not a direct derivative like paper debt notes were of gold, but in, in one way or another. And, and what do I mean by that? I mean that if Bitcoin adds uh, itself to the United States balance sheet, like Donald Trump was saying with a strategic stockpile or reserve, well, that fixed the biggest problem that we have because we are forced deficit spending is actually making the liability side of our balance sheet grow faster than the asset side of our balance sheet. And everybody is focused on the liability side of the balance sheet. Oh, well, we can cut spending. Well, no, we can't. Oh, well, we can do this or we can do that. It's, it's funny because nobody's really paying attention to the asset side of the balance sheet. And the excuse is always the, the economy. So it's like, oh, well, if the economy grows, then we'll be okay. We can outgrow the debt. So the mindset is there, the understanding of the importance of the asset side of the balance sheet is there, but the focus still remains on the liability side of the balance sheet. What I think Bitcoin is going to do is it's going to start to bring attention back to that asset side of the balance sheet because it's the only option we really have. The United States borrows $1 and then spends it into the economy to create less than $1 worth of economic growth. So that's why the liability side of the balance sheet is growing faster than the asset side of the balance sheet. And the economy itself, well, you shouldn't be surprised when you deflate GDP, when you deflate nominal GDP by the real inflation rate, not by the reported CPI rate, then real GDP has been negative since uh, the second quarter of 2022, which is in the first quarter of 2022, the, the Federal Reserve started raising interest rates. And they said, we're doing this to cause demand destruction. So nobody should be surprised when it caused demand destruction. From that point forward, there was a little bit of a lag, right? Because we didn't see it until after the following quarter. But after that little bit of a lag, the economy started to contract. And we've, been in, we've, we've now gone through nine consecutive quarters of contraction. The definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of negative GDP. So we've been in a recession for quite some time with nine consecutive quarters of slightly negative GDP. Three more quarters of negative GDP, and the United States will fit the textbook definition of a depression because a depression is three years or 12 consecutive quarters of negative GDP. So we shouldn't be surprised that the Federal Reserve raising interest rates brought about that result. That was the goal of that campaign. And now when we look at it and we say, well, wait a second, the economy is shrinking. That means our tax revenues are going to go down. Well, that means the deficit's going to increase, which liabilities are going to increase even more than the asset side of our balance sheet. Now, a couple of things we got going for us is we have the best, most robust capital market in the world. So that helps. Uh, and the second thing we have is oil. Uh, and that was another thing that, that ties right into Bitcoin. Trump said low cost energy producer. How? By tapping into the oil. And interestingly, the United States, I just learned this this morning, actually. I saw, I, I forget who posted it, but over the last six years, the United States has been the largest producer of crude oil in the world, even bigger than Russia and Saudi Arabia. So I'm not sure how much tapping into that oil is really going to help since we've been the largest producer of crude oil for the last six years. But we do have that oil. We are sitting on a lot of oil and we can tap into that. So we have capital markets, oil and a, and a strong economy for the tax revenues. That's pretty much the asset side of our balance sheet. That's all we got working for us. The liability side, we have $35 trillion in debt, $217 trillion of unfunded liabilities. Uh, and it's not, looking, it's not looking too good because we have growing deficits because of that demand destruction campaign, lowering tax revenues and increasing deficits. So the question becomes, 
what can we do if if we can borrow a dollar and we create less than one dollar of economic growth and then we only get 15 to 20 percent tax on that economic growth so you're not even getting a one-to-one you know that's, that's a big thing behind ai people cut well when ai kicks in the the economy is going to ramp up big time so the, you know ai will add a trillion to our economy so we can add a trillion to our debt it's not a problem yeah, but the government doesn't get the full benefit of the trillion added to the economy. They only get that 15 to 20 percent of tax revenue from that trillion. So you need, you need four, five times, six times more uh, economic growth than you do liability growth in order for the tax revenues to match the amount of money being borrowed and spent into the economy for it just to be equal, just to keep thing, just to keep debt to GDP where it is right now. And then you say, well, what about real estate? Well, real estate is a multi-hundred trillion dollar asset class. You can't print enough money to, to prop up that value to get assets to support liabilities. What about gold? Well, you know, that's, that's an interesting concept on gold because we see bricks going the gold route. And you hear a lot of gold bugs say this. What if they just reprice gold to $50,000? Okay, but when you reprice gold to $50,000, it doesn't change the cost of production to rip out the gold of the ground and provide it to the marketplace. So that increase in significant increase in profitability, they will literally be renting Elon Musk's rocket ships to go into space to go get those big uh, asteroids that are made of gold to bring them back to Earth because that's how much profit they'll have because the cost of production will still be two thousand instead of trading for twenty five hundred dollars with a five hundred dollar uh, profit, you'll have forty nine thousand five hundred dollars of profit per ounce. Well, you know what? <laughs> that's going to create. Uh, uh, an expansion of supply. It's one of the reasons that absolute digital scarcity in Bitcoin is so important of a concept because there is no supply expansion. Only hash rate can supply, which pushes up difficulty. So even gold can't rebalance the balance sheet. And then uh, even though it's a $15 trillion asset class, right? So it's a smaller asset class relative to real estate, but there's still not anything you can really do to bolster the asset side of our balance sheet. So what the heck can we do? What can we do? And that's that's the problem I want people to wake up to. You know, I said all of that so that people can say, wait a second, you know, maybe this isn't it isn't all about the deficit spending. It's not all about the liability side. We can focus on the asset side. And if we take Bitcoin and listen to Trump uh, or whoever gets in there to make that decision, I don't really care who it is. Whoever says they're going to promise to get in there and make Bitcoin a strategic reserve, that's who I'm going to vote for, because that's what we need. We need to get Bitcoin on our balance sheet. And then as we print money, Nothing is going to grow faster than Bitcoin. A trillion dollars into Bitcoin or a bill like Senator Loomis from Wyoming, if, some, if Trump did the strategic reserve and then that bill passed through Congress and the, you, now the U.S. government is starting to stack Bitcoin to get up to that one million Bitcoin goal to later then be extended and to build the, the asset side of your balance sheet. The amount of equity value that will be driven into the asset side of your balance sheet will actually strengthen the dollar. And we see that in El Salvador. That is what's happening in El Salvador. El Salvador is buying Bitcoin. And every day they buy Bitcoin. And then as the price of Bitcoin goes up over time, the asset side of their balance sheet is growing faster than the liability side of their balance sheet. It's the opposite of what we have here in the United States and most countries around the world. And that's why JP Morgan and all the credit agencies and even the IMF who hates El Salvador and wants them to be a debt slave like the rest of us, is getting so pissed off, but they still have to raise the credit score of El Salvador because the asset side of their balance sheet is growing faster than the liability side. It's less risky to lend to them than to other people whose liabilities are growing faster than their assets. So it's just a really interesting dynamic coming to play that nobody's really talking about in the space. And I, I, I love Peter Dunworth because he's dived into it and he, you know, he's put on a Bitcoin masterclass on how we need the asset side of the balance sheet to grow faster than the liability side, not just here in the United States, but for all countries who are abusing their citizenry and extracting value through inflation. It's, it's funny that you mentioned Peter Tamroff because it was literally the previous guest, like, <laughs> like <laughs> the previous recording was with Peter and you also get uh, his, his question. And there's a lot of uh, really interesting points there. Um, do you think uh, that Bitcoin might be even able to save the US dollar and maybe extend uh, uh, the life of dollar and, and fiat currencies when they are backed properly with, with Bitcoin to a very long uh, time frame or even forever? I do. 
I do think that. I think that if the if we start adding Bitcoin to the asset side of our balance sheet, that makes the trust trend change, right? I, I, I believe we said it last time we talked about the collapse of Rome and how do we define inflation to hyperinflation? The textbooks try to define it mathematically, but in my studies, you can't do that, right? And we dove into all of that, how it's different with each society and culture and economy. But the one thing that was the same across all of those areas, Greece, Rome, Weimar, uh, Argentina, Venezuela, the loss of trust, right? In Venezuela, they had an election. Nobody trusted the results. Their currency lays worthless in the streets. In Argentina, Malay won. People still trusted the results. Even though they've printed enough for that currency to be lighting and sitting in the streets, it's not. Because What's the difference? Trust. So the difference between inflation and hyperinflation is trust. So the trust trend for fiat currencies is going down because the trust trend in governments is going down. However, if you get the government to start adding Bitcoin to the asset side of their balance sheet, that could actually reverse the trend. We could see trust start to rebound so that people would have more confidence in the country and more confidence in what backs the currency because we have real world assets, in this case, real world digital asset that is supporting the liability side of our balance sheet because it's the, it's the explosion of the liability side of our balance sheet that leads to the loss of trust. And it's the loss of trust that changes us from inflation to hyperinflation. So if you add Bitcoin as an asset to the balance sheet and you start to grow the asset side of your balance sheet faster than the liability side, I would trust them more. Now, I wouldn't trust them to stop printing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to save in the dollar. I mean, it's a currency. It's a medium of exchange. It's not a store of value. There's a big difference there. So you still have to remember the fundamental difference between money versus currency. But I'm going to trust that currency a lot more than I do right now as the liability side rapidly outpaces the asset side of the balance sheet. So I do think it would be a mechanism for adding more trust and elongating uh, the dominance of the medium of exchange uh, being fiat currencies all throughout the world. I 100% agree uh, with you. The only thing that I, I have a hard time wrapping my, wrapping my head around this long term when we actually come to the point where you have the US dollars and you have uh, Bitcoin as the backing of the US dollar or at least like reserves uh, of, of the US dollars is in Bitcoin. Uh, and it's probably known. Uh, it's it's something that more people are aware of. And then you can also use Bitcoin as like a global digital currency basically uh, unless with gold with gold uh, it's it's hard to <laughs> transfer gold from uh, me austria to, to you in, in in america but we can really quickly make a bitcoin transaction uh, and we have final settlement in like 10 minutes uh, or, or, uh, or less even um so like what, what's stopping then the the bitcoin to completely overtake the fiat currencies if uh, fiat currencies is just like bitcoin with a little bit extra power to the government, a little bit extra printed uh, to, to the Bitcoin? Right now, so right now it's medium of exchange. And that's the biggest threat to Bitcoin. Because in the long run, I do want a Bitcoin standard. And I am cheering on a Bitcoin standard. And I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. So I don't want people to misinterpret this as, oh, you know, I, I want the government to still be able to extract value from my fellow citizens by printing money. I'm strongly against that. I stand against that. We're just game theory right here. We're just trying to figure out how this process is going to work. And the biggest problem for Bitcoin right now is medium of exchange, right? So you look back at gold and gold started out as a store of value. Now it took hundreds of years for gold to <laughs> become the dominant store of value. Bitcoin has done it in 15 years, less than 15 years, really. So it's the, the pace and, ex and acceleration of what's happening is beautiful to see and I'm cheering it on. But the brick wall that we're hitting right now is is evolving from a medium of exchange or excuse me from a store of value and then adding that medium of exchange component right because you look at gold it was a store of value but we had a problem it was not a good medium of exchange that you could not get the type of monetary velocity uh, in order to support rapid economic growth and expansion because if you went into the store you have to weigh it out you have to you know melt it down. I mean, there, it's to do that and it slowed things down. So it limited monetary velocity. So gold needed an L2 solution. Isn't it funny right now? Bitcoin needs an L2 solution. Gold needed an L2 solution too. And what was that solution? 
paper notes and bank deposits, right? So debt notes or checks written against the gold that was held at the bank. And then when that happened, gold very quickly became the medium of exchange. And soon after that, it was adopted as the universal unit of account. So Bitcoin is, is, is right where gold was as it was trying to establish itself as the best medium of exchange by far without competition, right? Because now we're going, we're moving from barter uh, into just a complete currency system. That paper currency system was gold L, L2 and it worked and it worked beautifully. And now, and now Bitcoin is in that same thing. And we see lightning network, we see liquid, we see L2s like stacks with their SBTC and no, no one solution is going to win. There's going to be, you know, each one of those solutions is better for a certain scenario or a certain problem than another one. So the free market will use what they what, what best fits the the problem that they're trying to to defeat uh, and and delivers the most value to them. So it's an open market with with many different types of solutions that will work at the same time concurrently. There's no one winner, but we're trying to figure out how do we make it make sense for me to buy coffee with my Bitcoin? How do we make it make sense to to uh, increase monetary velocity without increasing block size because we can't increase block size because then you give up decentralization and that that destroys the whole thing. So you you have to keep blocks the way they are. Should block size should not even be part of the discussion ever because we need to keep those nodes very easy and cheap to set up and run. That's what affords the the decentralization. So that's a you can't go that direction. So since we can't go that direction, we need some type of L two. We need some type of way to increase velocity uh and you can't do it on chain just to you know the sheer amount amount of transactions would not be able to be fit into the blocks so we need a way to do this in order to open up that medium of exchange route and what's so interesting is that yeah you could use a lightning and you could then buy coffee with your bitcoin but isn't it better to borrow some dollars against your bitcoin create zero tax obligation, right? So capital gains tax, that's a big obstacle to medium of exchange. Because now when I go buy my coffee, hey, it's fantastic. It costs me sub pennies, right? It costs me less than a penny to send that transaction on some L2. However, I'm going to get taxed on that because now I've just sold it and I had a capital gain. You know, I might've bought that Bitcoin for five cents and I just bought a $7 coffee. Well, I need to pay capital gains on the, on the, on the difference between the five cents and the $7 I just spent. So capital gains tax on Bitcoin is a huge obstacle to it becoming a medium of exchange. So right now, it makes more sense because of that capital gains, but also because of the dynamic of the marketplace, because the governments are still forced to deficit spend. I want to hold my Bitcoin, right? That's where we get the, the saying hodl, don't ever sell your Bitcoin. And right now, in, with the dynamics in this marketplace, I'm sorry if you have to sell your Bitcoin. You should never be selling your Bitcoin. What has Michael Saylor showed us? You don't sell your Bitcoin. You sell dollars. And then you take those dollars and you buy Bitcoin because the compounding annual growth rate of Bitcoin is going to be higher than the amount of interest you need to pay to access those dollars. Therefore, you profit. So profit is, drives the invisible hand of the marketplace. Profit creates incentives. And right now, we are incentivized not to use Bitcoin as a medium of exchange because one, we get hit with the capital gains. And two, it makes more sense to borrow the currency, borrow the dollars against your Bitcoin, escape the tax obligation. And then over time, it, it's really like a self-repaying loan. That's where people's reserve self-repaying mortgage idea even comes from because the, the CAGR of Bitcoin outpaces your liability, right? Your asset grows faster than your liability. Therefore, at the end of it, you're in a better position. So these are some of the obstacles I think that Bitcoin faces in dominating the dollar but also now the question becomes well which which way empowers me more am i more empowered if i can spend my bitcoin to buy my coffee or am i more empowered to borrow dollars against my bitcoin and then buy the coffee and right now the answer is clear as day it makes much more sense to borrow against your bitcoin because again you you escape tax obligation and the the loan is basically free you get to pu pull forward some of your purchasing power at a negative carry rate. So for those reasons, it's going to it's going to be hard for Bitcoin to take the place of currency for for that money to also serve as a currency in the near future. Now like I said, in the long-term future, 
I hope the dynamics change. I hope we get some politicians in there that end capital gains tax on Bitcoin. And then that really starts to open up and make more sense for it to become a medium of exchange. But who knows? This I always said it like this. World War Three is being fought right now. And it started in the financial realm. And World War III is not USA versus China or Russia versus Ukraine or Iran versus Israel. World War III is the money changers versus the people. The, the people that Jesus sowed, his, he, 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 it was a righteous anger. He sat down on the step and he, for a couple hours, he weaved together that whip cord. He didn't, it was not a, a, a leftist libtard reaction like, ah, he, he took his time. He wove that cord together. And when he was done, he took that cord and he drove those money changers out of his father's house. He drove those thieves out of the house. And that's the war we fight right now. We fight against the, we, the people are fighting against the money changers and they're going to do everything they can in order to maintain control and uh, maintain the ability to raid the piggy bank via inflation. So it's a big obstacle. And in the long run, I hope we get there. I think Bitcoin is the Trojan horse, right? Bring it in as this perfect pristine collateral, borrow against it. But somewhere some that, somewhere down the line, Bitcoin without the human, without removed, right? Because Bitcoin removes the human element from monetary policy and it cages the human element with everything else. But in the fiat system, you have an uncaged, free to roam, free to destroy human variable. And at one point it will destroy. And when it does, Bitcoin will be there waiting for us as that perfect solution. But until then, we have to integrate it and we have to do it in a way where people are incentivized by profit because it's that profit that drives free market incentives and it's free market incentives that are going to actually produce results and bring change through we the people. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. This Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your Bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship setup, you have to talk to the Bitcoin way. If you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you get a 30-minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure, if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable, or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin. Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing coin vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time, but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way. I love that a lot. Uh, here, you're giving so great of uh, an explanations like uh, i don't have to ask a lot you, you're giving the whole answer i uh, really nice um we had never the topic actually of borrowing against a bitcoin it, it comes up there here and there a little bit um but what do you recommend when it comes to borrowing against your bitcoin are there any um i would say i think financially you can always do the right strategy wrong. <laughs> yeah. Like you, 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 you can. Uh, I had um, an old friend of mine reached out and like, oh, I bought Bitcoin, and then uh, she was showing me, and I was like, oh, <laughs> you bought Bitcoin Cash, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so like, uh, like even she had the right thought. She she learned about bit about Bitcoin. 
just a little bit, uh, a little bit. So she understands the power of Bitcoin, but then not enough that she understands the difference between Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. Um, so, so it's uh, it's it's always like with, with whatever strategy you're doing, you have to dive a little bit de- deeper to actually understand what you're doing. Uh, what can you recommend for us when it comes to borrowing against the Bitcoin? When does it make sense? Uh, what uh, best practices should we look out for when it gets dangerous? <laughs> should we get our keys away? Should we, like what are the solutions yeah so the the number one thing when you're borrowing against your bitcoin is that you have to understand that this marketplace is very young right now and because it's so young most of the companies are coming with a fiat mindset like at the bitcoin conference that trump spoke out uh i think right before him cantor fitzgerald made an announcement that they're getting into the bitcoin lending space well the way it works right now is that you post your Bitcoin as collateral uh, with with the lender, and and for some reason, you know, you have to borrow your Bitcoin for twelve to sixteen percent. Uh, and most of the time, that is is because that lender is working with a liquidity provider, and that liquidity provider is charging them somewhere around the risk free rate or the prime rate uh, to borrow. So you know, you post your Bitcoin as collateral, the the liquidity provider is lending that lender their money at say 6%. And then they turn around and tell you, well, you know, we got, I can't lend this money to you for less than 6% because then I'm losing money. But, you know, I'll lend it to you for 10% because I got to pay 6% to this guy for borrowing the money in the first place. And then, you know, I get the 4% afterwards as our profit, our incentive to make the loan to you. So the, the market is so young and that the lenders and liquidity provider providers have such a lack of understanding of what Bitcoin is as the most pristine form of collateral in the world that a lot of times it doesn't make sense to do that right now um, just because of the added additional risk. And then you have counterparty risk too. So there's very few companies that are offering uh, multi-signature uh, collateral options where you post your collateral, it's held in a multi-sig so that you know that Bitcoin's not being rehypothecated, right? Because that was that's what led to the collapse of the last bull market. People were posting their Bitcoin, borrowing against it. And then the people that they were uh, posting that Bitcoin to as collateral were rehypothecating the Bitcoin and doing other things with it in the background. If you borrow against your Bitcoin, you need to, to know that the person that you're posting that with as collateral is not going to rehypothecate it or not take it and do other things with it. It's not at risk of being lost or having another claim against it. It only serves its purpose for the lending that you want to do. And then the second thing that doesn't really make sense and that adds risk is the is the is the difference between the interest rate because you know this this baffles my mind and this is one of the reasons for, th- for that we're creating people's reserve a company who has a bitcoin mindset and understands bitcoin for what it truly is uh, versus just a speculative asset and and that is this how can i go into a bank or a mortgage broker or provider and show them my my earned income and then make a promise to them like okay here you go you know i make ten thousand dollars per month And my mortgage payment is going to be $3,000 per month. And I promise you, I'm going to keep making money. I'm going to keep going to work. I'm going to keep making money. And I promise you. And hey, look, over the last six, seven years, I have a a good credit score because I made promises to you and I've kept those promises. But these are promises. So when times are good, promises are okay. But when times go bad, promises go to shit. And you're able to go in and get a mortgage based on a promise for six to eight percent. If you have a good credit score, they'll give you around six. If you have a bad credit score, it'll be around eight if they even give you the money. So that's based on promise. And that's based on me having to continue to work and produce. But you, then you bring your Bitcoin, you bring a million dollars of Bitcoin to the table and say, oh, I want to borrow $500,000 against this. So there's literally zero risk. There's no promise being made or what, whatsoever. You are, you are borrowing less equity value than what the collateral value that you're posting. There's no risk to the lender. And instead of instead of getting a six to eight percent rate, now I'm gonna getting a 12 to 16 percent rate. Talk about getting double screwed, right? I'm posting, I, I made a promise with the traditional bank. They gave me six percent. I can break that promise and mess up the whole cycle. I can't break the promise over on the Bitcoin side because if if I walk away from you, if I break that promise and I walk away from you or for whatever reason. You can just liquidate my collateral, just sell the $500,000 of Bitcoin plus interest and then leave the rest there in my account for when I come back to get it. And there's no risk to you. There's no default risk at all. 
Well, interest rates, now this is the problem with interest rates. We do not have free market interest rates. When, in, when the interest rate is stated by a group of men, the free market is not determining that rate. So in Bitcoin and, and in decentralized finance or borrowing against your Bitcoin, the rate is, is based on the free market. When the supply of money is high and the demand for money is low, rates will fall. When the supply of money is low and the demand is high, rates will go up. But there's also another element of interest rate, which is the credit score, which is risk. So the, 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 the interest rate should also be based on risk. And when you have an over collateralized loan as a lender, you're like foaming out the mouth. Like, and that's what people's reserve is. People's reserve are, are smart Bitcoiners coming together with their liquidity and saying, hey, uh, you call U.S. government treasuries risk free, but I don't feel like they're risk free. And if I can loan to a if I can loan my money to a Bitcoiner for four percent or six percent when the risk free rate is five percent, I'd much rather take a hundred basis point cut and have a risk free loan, a true risk free loan covered by the collateral itself, than lend money to the government because the government. Yes, there's no credit risk. Absolutely. There's no credit risk to U.S. Treasuries because they can print the money and they can pay it to you. You will get paid 100% guaranteed. What you don't know is when you get paid, what the hell are you going to be able to buy? The next thing you don't know, especially with what's going on in the United States right now, I feel like a lot of people who don't live here, like I'm in the United States fish tank. You're in your fish tank. The U.K. is in their fish tank. You might have you might have vacationed there. You might have seen some nice things, and but we don't know what it's like to live there, and we don't know what it, the, the politics are like there. But here in the United States, it's almost just like COVID. I see families are dividing over this political discourse that's happening right now. So that's you know that's what happened during the Civil War. You had brothers fighting brothers and cousins fight, fighting cousins over the political discourse. And, and we are devolving, in my opinion, that it's 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 falling pretty fast right now. And I'm not really sure what's going to happen after the election, because in 2020, the MAGA people said, OK, you know, we're going to have a peaceful protest and we're going to fight this through the courts. Well, in Georgia, we found out in the courts there were 300,000 votes in Georgia that were cast illegally. Biden won Georgia by 12,000 votes. So much more than 12,000 votes were cast for him out of those 300,000 votes that were cast illegally. Therefore, we, that should have been a recount. There should have been a recount. There, it was uh, The results are skewed. So a lot of people who are conservative, and it doesn't mean you have to support Trump. It just means that you want conservative values. So people who are looking for conservative values, we are naturally more conservative. So we had a peaceful protest. The Democrats won. They won in 2020. They still went after the peaceful protesters, even though they won. Instead of just saying, oh, hey, nice try. You know, maybe you'll get us next time and then moving on. No, they went back and attacked the people who went for the peaceful protest. You and I and everybody listening to this both know if real patriots went to Washington, D.C. on January 6th, there would have been a lot more firing and it would have lasted more than one day. Those were peaceful protesters and they came and attacked them. So what happens if Trump wins this time, what happens if it's too big to rig uh, and, and you know, they'd have to steal enough votes where there were more more votes were cast than eligible voters in order to steal it? Well, if they attacked us after they won, I don't want to know what they're going to do after they lose. And then vice versa, if they win again, if they if, it, if it's if it's, uh, you know, if RFK stays in the race and, and draw some votes from the conservative side uh, and somehow they have enough to, to steal or even win. Uh, then what are the MAGA people going to do? Are we going to are we going to be conservative this time and try to fight it through the courts again, or are we going to be a little bit more aggressive? I don't know the answer to that question, but in my mind, as a money manager, what I'm saying is that's risk. So I have the inflation risk. There's no credit risk, great, but I have inflation risk. I have civil war risk. And you know, the last time we went into civil war, uh, there was a uh, the Montgomery issuance, the Southern states, the Confederacy. They could not bank with their enemies, so they had to create their own system. They created ca Confederate debt notes, Confederate currency, and it ended up being worthless because they, they lost the war. But there was an economic divide. There was an economic split, and it came back to the issuance of treasury debt. So if there's an economic divide, if the people in Florida and Texas and the Bible Belt don't want to pay to give 
all these illegal immigrants who are going to New York to get twenty thousand uh, dollars for just showing up. You get a, a Walmart card or, or a cash debit card with twenty thousand dollars on it. They're getting food stamps. They're getting all. They're taking advantage of all the programs that are designed to help American citizens, uh, and they're doing it in a way that is illegal. It's perfectly okay to do that in a way that's legal. That's why the system is set up to help you. It's there to provide legal help for you to to get those things to help you get ahead in life. But when you illegally take advantage of it, it creates a problem for everybody. And now they're taking. Uh, what if we don't want to pay for that anymore? What if What if the North doesn't want to pay for a program that we come up with? Who's in who's in control of the Treasury? What happens if there is a, a division? Who gets the right to print the money? Who's in charge of rolling over the debt? Who's in charge of of of, of all of this stuff? It's it's a very big risk to lend your money to the government right now, especially the U.S. government. I and mean, the whole world doesn't see it that way. But there's a lot of people who do see it that way. And we'd rather lend our money to Bitcoiners that have that take out loans against their Bitcoin in an over collateralized fashion where we have no default risk, zero default risk. And we, we see that as a much uh, less risk than lending to the government. And I think this this idea and this understanding, we know that other countries are already selling out of treasuries because they see that same risk. We see BRICS organizing against that movement to kind of transfer that risk to themselves versus the United States. And with all of that taking place, you know, it comes back to, what do the lenders want to do? Because a lot of people want to borrow. That's, that's you know, people could get this, get this confused. When you go to the bank and you want to borrow, the bank can say no. The power of the credit market is in the lender, not the borrower, right? So what do lenders want to lend into? And, and for us and for people who understand Bitcoin, I think it's very just common sense when you look at nominal returns versus real returns that you want to be lending to people who are borrowing against their Bitcoiners. It's not going to be nation states who are the risk-free borrowers in the future. In the very near future, it's going to be Bitcoiners who are the risk-free borrowers and who set the risk-free rate within the marketplace. And that's about that's what People's Reserve is all about, leveraging that understanding to empower both lender and borrower. I love that. Um, because you mentioned Trump, uh I think one thing that uh, I want to do, because like for me, I'm in Austria, so like for me, the election is, uh, is nice to watch, but I cannot do anything anyway. So I will, uh, on the election day, when they are counting it, I will stay up late so I can see it because it will be very late on my side. It will be probably like two in the morning or something like that. Um, but I always lo love that. And I did it last, uh, last two times also, like uh, eight years ago uh, and four years ago. Um, but is Trump... And or RFK, depending on, on what you're voting for, is are those two the, the obvious choices for, for Bitcoiners? If you blend out all the other things that you might want to consider in elections, you might not want to be a single issue voter. I would be. <laughs> uh, I will be. Uh, in We have in September also elections in, in Austria. Uh, unfortunately, Bitcoin is not a topic here. <laughs> So I have to find other things that are closer to Bitcoin. But do you think that, that Trump is, is the obvious choice for Bitcoiners? I think Trump is probably the best choice for Bitcoiners. And I think that's because um, RFK, you know, they, they both deal in a little bit of shitcoinery, which I don't like. So I don't think either of them is really the, the perfect candidate. But, you know, in what world are we going to get the perfect candidate? It's just not going to exist. So... It, it, it is definitely a, a hard choice. I think, like you said earlier, people kind of, uh, they were so blown away by what RFK said during the conference that what Trump said was kind of belittled uh, because of, of the way he had to make his statements. But I do think that both Trump and RFK have taken at least a couple orange pills uh, and, and can see which way it's going. But I also think that Trump has more support than RFK. So God forbid Trump was actually assassinated not that long ago. And now we're looking at, you know, who can it be? Then, you know, nobody can replace Trump, uh, but RFK would be the go-to guy. And I was kind of hoping that Trump would like bring RFK in on, on his team. Like maybe you don't want to be vice president. Maybe you want to be the head of the Department of Homeland Safety or, or, or health and and. Uh, Whatever, you know, like RFK is really good on vaccines. So let's get him going out and fighting these people and, and making sure the right regulations are, are being created and the right safety protocols are being set up so that we can have safe vaccines. 
because it's not like there's no such thing as safe vaccines. There are. But because of the deregulation, because of the corruption of fiat money, these vaccines are actually more dangerous than they are helpful. But when vaccines first came out, they were more helpful than they were dangerous. So what happened? Uh, science is, is corrupted by the fiat money printing machine and, and corrupted by uh, greed. So w RFK would be the perfect guy to get in there to help fight that. But he doesn't have the same base as Donald Trump. That's the problem. Trump has that conservative base. He has the, the make America great again base. And that is what's easiest to build around. It's easiest to build around, make this country great again. I think more people from both sides both feel that something's wrong in the country. It's trending the wrong way. And it's, it's actually in the whole world. The whole world is trending the wrong way. And we need somebody to help make it great again. Just get back to these common sense policies instead of modern monetary theory, instead of open borders, instead of a two-tiered legal system. Let's just go back to like, Fair game, fair rules. It reminds me of Monopoly, right? When you play Monopoly with your friends or family, the game's really fun in the beginning. But after the game, after it's like established, it starts to get bored. You start to throw money in free parking. You start to come up with different rules to make it fun. And that's where we are in real life. The game has become so ex overextended that now all these crazy rule changes and everything's are. Uh, and in this case, it's detrimental. It's detrimental to society. It's detrimental to culture. Uh, no borders in Europe, no borders in the United States, no borders in the UK. Everything's falling apart. There's no there's I've seen a, videos of people getting pulled out of their home from the UK police for retweeting a tweet. And then meanwhile, there's a group of 10, 15 illegal immigrants walking around with baseball bats, smashing random car windows, closing businesses down. And there's not a police in sight. So let's get back to, to having good police. Why aren't police paid better? Why aren't firefighters paid better and ambulances paid better? Why, why aren't teachers paid better? These are all common sense things that most people agree on that, you know, where, where we should focus our spending and where we should focus on how to fix this problem is to make us great again, to get rid of America, make humanity great again. Humanity is falling off the edge of the cliff. We need to make it great again. And that's a really good message to unify around that most people agree with. I wish that they would unify around truth money because I don't think we should unify. If you're going to unify around one man, it has to be Jesus Christ because you cannot unify around man and, and have success. So if you're going to unify, it should be around an idea. And that idea is economic freedom, economic liberty. And that's found in truth money and that's Bitcoin. So in my opinion, that's the best way to move forward. And when you look at Trump and you look at RFK, neither of them are working on that platform. RFK speaks very well about Bitcoin, but it's not his main driver. Trump says what makes people happy about Bitcoin, but it's not his main driver. I think eventually over time, what we're going to see as Bitcoin continues to uh, make its way into the political space and political realm, you're going to see much more competent politicians who became Bitcoiners. And like, like the saying goes, you don't change Bitcoin, Bitcoin changes you, right? Just take some time. So we need these politicians to adopt Bitcoin and then we need them to spend some time with it so that Bitcoin can change them so that we can start to change the focus to, to a more economic focus rather than a virtue signaling focus. And, and neither candidate does that. So it's a tough question because you have to pick somebody. Uh, you can't not pick anybody or else now it's too big to rig again. And they're just going to steal it. So I, you know, me personally, I'll be voting for Trump and I hope that RFK drops out and endorses Trump. But I hope that is not because he's forced to do that. I hope that's because Trump opens the door and, and, and gives him a high level position that he wants. And say, look, Bobby, what do you want? What do you want to do? Drop out, support me. I will put you in whatever spot you want to be in. And then I'd expect RFK to be like, that's not good enough. I got about 50 people I want to bring with me if you want me to get this job done right. And Trump should say, you got it. You get whatever spot you want and you get to name 50 other people where they need to be to help you get this job done guaranteed. And now we can start to move forward. Now, now we can get, you know, why do I have to choose between the both of them? Let's team up. Let's, let's get together understanding that you have some good things with make America great again. I have some good things with some common sense fixes. Let's work together to make it better again. And we're not, and we're just not seeing that. So I, I love both of them, but I'll be voting for Trump. And I hope that Trump is able to get RFK to 
drop out and endorse him so that he can play a big role in helping Trump drain the swap, something he failed to do last time while spending quite a bit of money. Uh, we need to we need to change it. We need to change it. We need to change it fast or, or else we're at risk of trust being lost. And if trust is lost before we figure out putting Bitcoin on the balance sheet, then at that point, there's no there's no way to get back to it. I think even if trust is lost and you move from inflation to hyperinflation, even if you add Bitcoin to the balance sheet too late, it's like one of those things like once it happens, I'm shot. You can't get unshot. It's done. Once it happens, you need to react. Uh, and unfortunately, um, we we might see that, but I'm hoping and praying that we don't. And I'll be casting my vote for Trump. And I, I you know, I see um, I got to bring this up because Dennis Porter, who is a great advocate and he's the head of Satoshi Action Fund and everybody should be behind them and should support them. But, you know, he came out and he said that, you know, he, he was joking around, but he's just like as the last uh, non-political Bitcoin spokesperson, you know, the problem with that position of being apolitical and not taking a side is that one side is trying to use the law against you. So you you can't just ignore that. You have to actually use the law to protect yourself. And I and I and I point back to the Constitution. You know, the founding fathers didn't use the law to start a war with Great Britain. They used the law to protect humans' God-given rights. That that was the point. We want to be independent and we want to be governed by ourselves. And then once they were, now we're going to use the law to protect God-given rights, to protect people from government, not to protect the USA from Great Britain or France. And we need to get more of that ideology in politics. And that that ideology is really, that's the Bitcoin mindset. The Bitcoin mindset is about protecting your fellow men through monetary law. You can't let the, any, someone steal from you. You can't let someone uh, dilute the value of your labor. You can protect your time and savings through space based on the value that you deliver to others. And they can have their value protected because we have the correct monetary laws. And those are the, uh, found in Bitcoin and nowhere else. So what a time to be alive, to see all of this kind of coming together all at the same time. It's definitely going to be an interesting six months. Absolutely. I, I fully, <laughs> fully agree with that. And it's also interesting for me um, because I was very political uh, before Bitcoin. Bitcoin kind of made me a little bit more apolitical, but now I'm getting a little bit more back in because I realized that first I realized that um, Bitcoin, Bitcoin itself doesn't care about politics. But you as a Bitcoiner should care about politics because the jurisdiction you live in, they can make laws and they can make your living hell. <laughs> so, That's right. So, so uh, either you have to fight the politics in your country or you uh, have to leave the country and, and go somewhere where it's, it's better for you. But making a blind eye to politics as a Bitcoiner um, is just, it's just not the right move. Like you have to open your eyes and you have to see, okay, what, what things are going on in my political jurisdiction? Uh, what's going on? Uh, I mean, in, in Austria, it's, uh, it's easy because you have to see Austria and you have to, to see the European Union and in America, like your state and, uh, what, what's going on at a federal lo level. But it's, it's, it, I think it would be ignorant to say like, oh, I'm apolitical. I don't care what politics do because I have Bitcoin. Yeah. But you have a physical body <laughs> and they have physical guns <laughs> and <laughs> they can make you do things. So I yeah. think it's important to, to vote and uh, influence that system. Well, Bitcoin, Bitcoin shows no bias, right? We, that's what we love about it. It shows no bias. Bitcoin is for everyone. It's monetary law that protects everyone. But because Bitcoin shows no bias, we as people must show bias. That's the trade-off. Now, if you don't want that, you actually want political fiat currency units because political fiat currency units show bias, right? If you're Russia, you got your reserves taken from you and you even had your reserves taken from you and given to your enemy. The dollar shows bias so that we won't have to. So you don't want to give up your right to show bias. You should have a right to be biased and the money should not have a right to be biased. So that's what's so great about Bitcoin. Bitcoin shows no bias. It's for everyone. But that means that we have to be more responsible as a people and we have to show bias. We can't let the next Adolf Hitler or Mao get into office because we don't want to show bias because, because Bitcoin doesn't show bias and Bitcoin is for everyone. 
yeah, Bitcoin is for everyone. But you know what? I don't want my enemies to have Bitcoin. I don't want people who are trying to attack my children to have Bitcoin. I don't want people who want the government to be able to tell me that I have to stay in my home and take a vaccine to work to buy Bitcoin. So yeah, Bitcoin shows no bias. Bitcoin is for everyone. But that means now humans have the added responsibility of being biased and being proactive to make sure that that money gets into the right hands through the power of ideas and value accrual versus just printer go burr and everybody gets their universal basic income and let us, the government, show the bias for you so that you don't have to worry about it. Horrible trade-off. Horrible trade-off. Bitcoin shows no bias so that we can show bias. And if you don't like that, well, then stick with your fiat political currency units because then you don't get to choose what to be biased against and the, and the, the currency itself controlled by the government will choose where to show bias. And one day that bias is going to show up on your doorstep and you're not going to be able to, to have any freedom to spend that money the way you want to because it's a, it's a central bank digital currency. It expired or somebody's already bought enough bacon this month, so you're not eligible to buy. I mean, that's where we're going. If you want, if you want to show bias in currency, we're, you can adopt the central bank digital currency. If you want your money to be every, for everyone, then it has to be Bitcoin. But you have to take the added step of added responsibility to show bias and to communicate why ideas are good and bad and to allow the free market to understand those ideas and then act on those incentives. Two kind of counterpoint systems, which is amazing to, to think about, especially when we just talked about how one could support the other based on where we are in, in the dynamics of the marketplace. I love that a lot. Really cool. Um, as the time is already very progressed, I want to bring in one more topic because we also discussed it in the beginning, uh, Bitcoin bonds and what they can do for nations, uh, for America, but for, for every nation. I mean, we have already with El Salvador an example. Um, what can they do if like America actually goes ahead and has a Bitcoin bond? Uh, and second to that, what will that unlock as a new frontier for Bitcoin. I mean, the ETF was a major financial instrument, but what would Bitcoin bonds do for, for the Bitcoin price action? Yeah, so this is, I've dedicated the last three years of my life to this product and we've been building in stealth and we're going to go live first quarter of next year. So I'm really excited to finally really be able to be talking about it. And what's so important about Bitcoin bonds is the, the first thing that I hear back when I talk to a lot of big people they go, listen, son, we're lenders. We're not investors. We're not going to invest in Bitcoin. Number one, because their charter doesn't let them. Uh, or number two, regulation doesn't let them. Uh, and we actually, we just heard Michael Saylor talk about that the other day. He came on and said that, um, you know, what problem are you solving? The problem is that a Chinese businessman can't buy Bitcoin directly, can't buy the ETFs, but he can buy debt that's issued by MicroStrategy. Right. So he can he can lend his money to MicroStrategy and get exposure to Bitcoin. And that's what this is all about. It's about reaching a whole new marketplace, not just investors, but lenders. And there's a lot of lenders in the market, like a money market fund. Money market funds can't invest. They have to lend. OK, so the, the, the market for lending is a really big marketplace. A lot of people just think that, you know, the quadrillion worth of wealth in the world is all investing. Or they confuse investing with lending and, and the different types of regulation around both of those strategies. But it's very different. And, and Saylor laid that out perfectly. So what Bitcoin bonds are structured for, not necessarily investors, for lenders. And it's a two-part thing because um, you see a, a program like Social Security in the United States. They have to keep raising the full retirement age. Uh, and they have to keep lowering the value of the benefit in real terms. right? So although the the amount of money you're receiving goes up, the cost of living goes up faster. So the quality of life and standard of living provided for through social security continues to crash. So we have a really big problem. And that is that social security has like 10 years left before uh, it has to start picking out of the piggy bank and, and it's going to be done. So it'll end very quickly from that point. It'll accelerate uh, into, into nothing. And Bitcoin bonds enters the scene as a solution for lenders because what happens is it creates a positive feedback loop. And this is where it plays into the price of Bitcoin. Because when you have uh, more demand, it, it creates uh, more issuances. And then when you have more issuances, it creates more demand on spot Bitcoin. When you have more demand on spot Bitcoin, it pushes up the price of Bitcoin. 
which then increases the yield of the note itself. And I'll get into that in a second. And then when the yield increases on the note, it creates more demand. So when you have more demand, you have more issuances. It creates a positive feedback loop. So you can your listeners can kind of picture that positive feedback loop in their in their mind. There's more demand because you have higher yield. And then because there's higher higher yield, you have more issuances, more demand on spot Bitcoin, price goes up, more demand for issuances, and so on. Okay. Well, here's how it would work. Let's say the United States um, has has the, the first thing you have to do is you have to get Bitcoin. And this is where the global hash war comes into play. Putin just uh, making a cryptocurrency and Bitcoin mining legal in Russia. Countries trying to get their hands on Bitcoin. And, and they can get their hands on Bitcoin to create a stockpile and reserve to help their asset side of the balance sheet like we talked about. But what about the times that they need to sell that Bitcoin if they need to sell that Bitcoin or if they can sell that Bitcoin in a way that benefits other portions of the balance sheet? And that's what the Bitcoin bond really helps companies do. So in this case... I'd like to do the social security example where the U.S. government would be the issuer. So the U.S. government would issue the Bitcoin bond. Let's say it's a billion dollar bond for just for math's sake. That's like pennies to them, but just so people can follow along the example easily. How it works is they issue the billion dollar bond. And let's say that you know Trump gets in and actually starts collecting tariffs in Bitcoin. Right. So we come we become that low cost energy producer. We start becoming a Bitcoin mining powerhouse. Maybe the country itself starts mining some Bitcoin. We're collecting Bitcoin through tariffs, and now we're starting to build up our Bitcoin. Well, what do we want to do? We want to recapitalize the republic. We want to make Social Security great again. How do we do that? Well, we have to make the asset side of the Social Security fund grow faster than the liability side. Isn't it funny how all these concepts come back and merge on the, on the balance sheet? The Social Security fund, it just holds government debt. It holds government notes, and it holds government bonds. And the problem is, is that those notes and bonds are negative yielding in real terms because the rate of inflation is higher than the rate of return. And the effective interest rate of the Social Security funds in 2023 was 2.4%. So even right now, if you believe the government's 3% CPI, it's still negative carry. And if you use govflation.com CPI, which uses the 1982 CPI before they did substitution, we're, we're at 10%. So the negative carry is upwards of negative 7%, which is significant negative carry. But this is why they have to keep raising the full retirement age and decreasing the, the payouts in real terms. They keep buying you less and less and less over time. So how do we fix this? Again, we need the asset side of the balance sheet to outperform the liability side. Unfortunately, that's that's exactly what a Ponzi scheme really is. And that's why the, you know, the problem is we have now is we have more people collecting social security than paying into it. So the liabilities grow faster than the assets. How do we fix this? Not with negative yielding government debt. So they issue the Bitcoin bond. It's a billion dollar raise. When they raise the billion dollars from the way they would do it is they take the social security tax. Now you're not selling the bond to the marketplace. You're selling the bond to the social security fund because the idea is you want to recapitalize the fund itself. Um, so at first you, you make that a private issuance from the, from the treasury to the social security fund, the social security tax income is what's invested into the bond, the Bitcoin bond, and they invest a billion dollars. Well, 80% of that money or $800 million will go into a U.S. treasury because the U.S. government is the issuer of the Bitcoin bond, right? It's, it's very exciting because at people's reserve, we're talking to a few different sovereigns. One of the sovereigns, uh, has about 30 billion barrels of oil off of their shore. So when they issued a Bitcoin bond, they would be issuing it from their nationalized oil company. So the bond would be backed by the oil in the ground that the country owns. In, the, in this case scenario, the bond is backed by the printer of the United States. So depending upon who issues the Bitcoin bond, the principal protected note portion of the bond differs, right? So most people would say, oh, if the US government issues the bond, then it's risk. It's a risk-free principal protection. And that's fine. You can, you can say that. And then uh, if there's a country that issues a Bitcoin bond with, say, $3 trillion of oil in the ground, well, that's pretty good principal protection too, right? It goes back to like, do you want to loan to the government with a printer or do you want to loan to that Bitcoiner who's posting Bitcoin collateral? Well, do you want to loan to the government with a printer or do you want to loan to the government with $3 trillion of oil in the ground? Or do you want to do both? I think both are, are pretty much okay with where we are right now. And uh, I prefer the oil, though, personally, because of the real world asset 
backing that principal protection versus just the government's printer. So at the end of the five-year note, what happens is, is that $800 million, it matures at a value of $1 billion. And this is really important from the lender side because when you're lending into the bond itself, the Social Security Fund cannot have nominal negative returns, right? If Let's say the Social Security Fund just bought a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. Well, what happens when they need to sell that Bitcoin at a time in order to pay some of the uh, the – uh, you know, that the pay to the, the con people contribute and they receive. So when you have to pay to the receivers, you have to sell some of your Bitcoin. But let's just say they timed the cycle bad. And in that cycle, Bitcoin is, you know, that billion dollars is only worth 800 million and they're down, they're negative. They can't take nominal negative risk. That's what the principal protected note does for Bitcoin. And, it, and it's really not a Bitcoin bond like you would think like El Salvador and Max Kaiser and Samson because they're collecting Bitcoin and then paying yield in Bitcoin. We flip the script to take advantage of the marketplace, which is the dollar denominated return on Bitcoin, the 60% CAGR on Bitcoin becoming the yield of the note because you bought the billion dollars, the 800 million went into the government debt. 200 million goes directly into spot Bitcoin. At the end of the five years, the 800 million matures at a value of 1 billion. So you have principal protection. You cannot lose. That's really important. You cannot lose. What do you gain? Well, what's left over is the performance of the $200 million of Bitcoin. Now, what's really interesting is if Bitcoin goes to zero, which you and I both know it's not going to, but even if it did, you don't lose. Okay, but what if Bitcoin goes down 50% in five years? Well, that's unprecedented, but let's just say it did. A lot of these people think that that could happen. Well, that 200 million turns into 100 million. So the note matures at a value of 1.1 billion. Well, 100 million divided by a billion is, is basically 10%, right? And 10% divided by five years in simple interest terms is 2% per year. So if you issue a Bitcoin bond, remember the effective rate of the Social Security Fund in 2023 was 2.3%. So if you issue a Bitcoin bond and in five years, the price of Bitcoin goes down 50%, which it wouldn't because remember the positive feedback loop, higher yields, more demand, more demand, more issuances, more issuances, more demand on spot Bitcoin, more demand on spot Bitcoin, higher Bitcoin price, higher Bitcoin price, higher yields. The positive feedback loop gets rid of that scenario. But if it even if it did go negative 50%, you're at 2% APY. And if the price stayed flat at 200 million, you're at you're at 4% APY. So if you issue a Bitcoin bond and the price of Bitcoin stays the same over 5 years, you are almost performing at 100% the rate of the existing effective rate of the social security fund. Now, what if Bitcoin really does what it's supposed to do? And this is what's so exciting about a Bitcoin bond. It's the, it's the price performance of Bitcoin that creates the yield on the bond. So you have the best performing asset in the world now creating the yield on the bond. So we have the lowest risk, highest reward cash flow vehicle that the marketplace has ever seen because Bitcoin is the best performing asset that the marketplace has ever seen. And we're, and we leverage that in this product. And now if Bitcoin goes, let's say Bitcoin sticks to its 60% CAGR over that five year period, the price of Bitcoin will go up 10 X in five years. So the price of Bitcoin right now would be trading around 600,000. Very realistic because that's about half the market cap of gold, by the way. A lot of people say, Oh, Bitcoin can't go to a million. Are you kidding me? It, during COVID Bitcoin went from 3000 to 60,000. That's 20 X based off of lowering interest rates and quantitative easing. We're about to go into that right now. We're about to lower interest rates. It's about to be uh, discovered that the Fed's demand destruction campaign was successful. We're going to need to do more deficit spending to, to fix the economy that they destroyed. And on those same things, Bitcoin, if it just holds 50,000 through this yield curve on inversion and through this process, that same move from 3,000 to 60,000 is the same measured move. It's a 20X from 50,000 to a million. And Bitcoin at 1 million is basically the market cap of gold, which is still a relatively small market cap uh, compared to all the other assets in the world. So that is very realistic. But in this case scenario, let's just say it sticks with its 60% CAGR. We're at 600,000. Well, that Bitcoin is now matured at 10X from 200 million to 2 billion. So you, you, you lent a billion, the Bitcoin turned into 2 billion. You get the billion back through the government debt. That's $3 billion upon maturation. That's 200% over the course of five years. That's 40% APY. 40, that's better than credit cards. And credit cards are junk debt. Credit cards are high-risk debt.
that many times gets defaulted on and gets sold for pennies on the dollar. And you're talking around 20 to 30 percent. Bitcoin could realistically, based on its previous past performance, without even accounting for the, the positive feedback loop of this process, could produce 40 percent APY. That is how you save Social Security. That is how you recapitalize the republic and make Social Security great again. That is how you take any government program in any country that is failing and you recapitalize it with Bitcoin bonds. So this product, we couldn't be more excited about the opportunity for governments, states, cities, municipalities, and even private corporations to issue Bitcoin bonds in order to attract lenders because that's the future we're heading into. People are not going to be okay lending at a negative rate, a, a very big negative rate. The rates thus far have not been too negative, but we're heading into a new era of all-time high inflation. And when we get there, it's not going to be subtracting the 10% inflation from the, from the 5%. It's going to be subtracting 15 and 20% inflation from the 0.1% or the 1% or 2% you get on long-term government debt. We're talking about negative returns in the teens so that over the course of just five and six years, almost 100% of your purchasing power has evaporated. And Bitcoin bonds solve this problem. Bitcoin bonds makes lending make sense again. And it also has the ability to recapitalize government programs that simply are, are destined for failure because of the reality of their existing asset side of their balance sheet having less and less purchasing power over the years, having a negative carry rate. That was that was a lot. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, and uh, it's really interesting. Uh, I think many still underestimate what's possible with Bitcoin being integrated in the traditional financial market. Because just as Wall Street is greedy and I want to do the, the Bitcoin ETF, there's a lot of other things that will come along the way. The Bitcoin ETF is not the, the last thing that, that happened in the traditional finance uh, system. It's more or less like the maybe the first thing, the ma first major thing that happened on, on that that front. Maybe Michael Salem with MicroStrategy was the first real thing. Um, but uh, there's a lot to come uh, in, in that world. And I'm really excited to, to see all the products, the companies, uh, all the excitements, and, and then also the, the purchasing power win in bitcoin it will be really interesting times yeah it's right now and and if i know that was a lot so what i recommend is for your listeners to just go to my twitter and go to my highlights section where i have a written tweet thread of this and it's much easier to follow along because i know i i laid it all on you fast and i was jumping back and forth but the the basic concept is now you can lend and get exposure to bitcoin you don't need to invest and you can lend in a way with principal protection so you can, if someone said, hey, I, you want to invest in Bitcoin, they go, yeah, but I can lose. No, no, not with this product. Well, what do you mean I can't lose? You can't lose. In nominal terms, you cannot lose. You might lose some purchasing power, but you're already losing purchasing power in government debt. So there's no difference. You can't lose in nominal terms and you can still get exposure. You can still get access to the best performing asset in the world. That's really what it simplifies down to. And, it, and through that positive feedback loop, the price of Bitcoin can go parabolic through this because if this were to be widely adopted, that that feedback loop drives value into spot Bitcoin, which then it, it must force up the price. That's what's so important about absolute digital scarcity. If there's more demand, there's a higher price and there's no other option. And then the higher the price that goes, the more yield on the note, right? Because the yield on the note is based on the performance of Bitcoin. So we can leverage the performance of Bitcoin. We can leverage the characteristic of absolute digital scarcity to empower we the people, to recapitalize the republic and to make any government program right now that is, is struggling to give it a chance to actually succeed uh, and to succeed in a way where in the long term, those benefits might be able to, to increase rather than being forced to decrease. And I think you know this is an option that all governments and all companies, all states, all provinces, all cities, municipalities, and corporations will be forced to consider eventually. But right now in the beginning, it's a great time to take advantage of these new products and services that are going to be coming to the marketplace. And they're going to pop up everywhere. They are going to pop up because the fiat system is dying. The fiat system is broken. And this is, like we were talking earlier, it's kind of like a temporary fix. But in the long run, 
It's part of Bitcoin becoming that Trojan horse, being integrated into the system. Forget about digitizing all these TradFi debt products. It's time to innovate. It's time to take what Bitcoin is and integrate it through innovation rather than um, just making it a store of value. It's going to be a medium of exchange, but let's make it the most pristine form of collateral in the world first. Let's do what we can do now to accelerate Bitcoin adoption and to accelerate the benefits to society at large uh, by leveraging its most amazing number go up technology that we've ever seen. Yeah, and I think it's important to um, notice that money has to go through the faces. Like it seems like, oh yeah, Bitcoin has not been a unit of account for 15 years. It has failed. Therefore, like that's, that's so funny to me. Like study, study history, study how long gold needed, study how long any money needed to, to be established as a store of value, the medium of exchange and everything. It's, it's, uh, stunning that Bitcoin is already where it is, like in just 15 years. Uh, and, and people are still unsatisfied. Oh, why can I not buy everything in Bitcoin right now? And their taxes and everything. Oh, yeah, <laughs> calm down. Patience, my friend. <laughs> um, really cool. Um, we come to the end now um, where there are two questions. The first question is always the same question for every guest. I think I think last time we spoke, we did not have the question. I did it after, yeah, I think I did it after the 100th episode. You were like 80 or something like that. Uh, and the question for you is, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin besides all the things that you we already covered. Yeah, I think I think the best thing is is that even if you're a Bitcoin billionaire, that's not enough. Because the time that we're moving into is going to be a time of trouble. It's going to be a time of being able to be sure that you have not just Bitcoin to protect your wealth, but oh, but how about some uh second amendment rights? How about a weapon to protect your family for self-defense? How about the ability to produce food and water and energy and community? Uh, these, these things are of the utmost importance. So you'll see me on my Twitter. I, I allude to these things that it's not just important to understand Bitcoin, but once you understand Bitcoin, you don't have to dive as deep as you and I do into it. Once you understand it, you just add it to your balance sheet. Let Bitcoin do the hard work, but your work is not done there. You need to learn how to defend your family, to access water, and food and community to go out and to meet Bitcoiners and shake their hands and grow the peer, the person to person economy. That is the, the, the utmost important thing that I give as a message besides Bitcoin and the Bible, Bitcoin Bible, and then preparedness. So that, that would be my answer. Get prepared, get, get Bitcoin in your balance sheet, read the word of God and, and go out and make friends and community members and barter with them, trade with them, Uh, establish a means of security, a plan of action in case the worst case scenario happens. Because, you know, we're, we're praying for the best, but we're preparing for the worst. Absolutely. And I think that's also a great gateway because uh, we talked about preparing for hyper-Bitcoinization. We're preparing for the fiat fall, I think, in the last episode, actually, with you. If people want to see that, just go on my channel, uh, uh, search for the name. You will see those two episodes uh, popping up. And the last one is really cool. You can also see a little bit the uh, progression of, of the <laughs> of the channel. I hope you see a quality increase, <laughs> uh, not decrease over, over the time. Uh, yeah, so thank you already uh, so much for coming on. Um, now to the end routine with uh, the guest, where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Your question from the previous guest, from <laughs> Peter Dunworth, uh, is what's the most important thing uh, for you personally about uh, Bitcoin? I think that the, the most important thing about Bitcoin is that it's engineered money. So we have gold as a natural money, and we learned many fantastic characteristics of gold, um, of money through gold. And what we're seeing is we're, we are now moving into to the techno technological age. Right. We had a candle and then we went we had a, a technological evolution. We did the light bulb and we had a horse and we went to a car and we had paper articles. And now everything gets on your cell phone and tablet. We have paper money and the next technological evolution is, is digital money. And Bitcoin is the perfect digital money. It's the engineered form of the natural and that absolute digital scarcity And the difficulty adjustment, like we talked in our previous episode, those are so important to Bitcoin playing the role that it does 
in having monetary law, right? So now that that monetary law works for us and that monetary law protects everybody in the system without showing bias, it now allows us to show bias so that we can make the world a better place so that we don't have to depend on the government to show bias and tell us what's right and wrong. But in our spirit, we can stand up for what we know is right and good uh, to make the world a better place. And that's that all comes from Bitcoin's design of engineered money. And I, that's the most important element. Ah, so beautiful. Perfect. Thank you, CJ, for, 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 for being on already. Um, where can people find you? Where can people reach out to you if they have asked? Uh, if they if they have questions, uh, where can people find you? Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. It's it's an honor to be back here. Your show is one of my favorite in the entire industry. You're killing it, and uh, I wish you the best and continued success. It's, it was an honor to come back for a second time, and hopefully we'll be able to do it again. And if you want to see more from me, uh, you can go to at CJ Constantinos on Twitter or YouTube, uh, and that's the best place to follow me. If you have any questions, you can just DM me. I'll do my best to to help as many people as I can to understand and, and deliver orange pills. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This was a pleasure. Thank you, CJ. And also thank you for everyone watching and listening. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.